Praise the Lord. I welcome you to our Tuesday development session for our leaders. And I pray that this will be a real development for every one of us in Jesus' name. I want to encourage you that as leaders, as we look at the Word of God, there may be things that appear new. You'll not just say, well, I don't understand that. You will move on and move up and move forward in your understanding of the Scriptures. Because today we're dealing with something very important, very specific, that will be a blessing to you and to every one of us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this hour. We thank you for this moment. Thank you for your people. Thank you for the interest you have given us. And thank you, Lord, because of the desire, the passion to serve you and serve you more and serve you better and serve wider range of people in our ministry. We are asking, O oh Lord, even at this time, when there appears to be a lockdown in many of the places, we still pray we'll touch more lives, we'll reach more lives, and we'll raise more lives for the glory of God in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that you open our understanding tonight and we pray that your word will so benefit us, enlighten us, illumine us, that we'll be so inspired. We go to teach other people and transform other people and raise up other people for your glory in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tonight we are coming to Psalm 8, and as we come to Psalm 8, we are reading from verse 4. Psalm 8, reading from verse 4. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? I want you to look at that question for a moment. What is man? that thou visited him? What is the son of man that you are mindful of him? The psalmist is asking this question, and the psalmist is asking the question from the Lord himself. You know, when you ask a question, the same question you can ask from different people, as you look at this, a great question, what is man? You could be asking Job or asking the friends of Job, and you'll be surprised what answer they are going to give you. In fact, let us turn to that. Let's turn to Job chapter 7. In Job chapter 7, let's read from verse 17. In Job chapter 7, verse 17, and look at what it's saying. It says, what is man? The same question, that thou shouldest magnify him, that thou shouldest set thine heart upon him. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, it says, and that thou shouldest visit him every morning and try him every moment. You see, Job and his friends had a different concept about man. What is man? And as you think about uh, their, their understanding about man, we're looking at Job chapter 14, and I'm reading from verse 4. In Job chapter 14, verse 4, it's telling us, it says, Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean load? Not one. You know what Job and his friends are saying? They're saying that man is unclean. Man is unrighteous. Man is, is unacceptable. Man is so weak, you cannot put any weight on him. And now if you were to ask people like Solomon, or ask even theologians, or ask philosophers, or ask the poets of that time, and the poets of today, they will not reveal the divine truth. But now when you ask God, only God can give the full answer and the comprehensive answer that will be complete because the Lord will be thinking of his power. He'll be thinking of his ability, his creative ability. And when you ask about man from God with grace or the grace of God, without grace, what can man be? And look at Psalm 39, and we're looking at verse 5. We're looking at man now without the grace of God. So when you ask that question, what is man? You must make up your mind. Are you asking about man without grace, man without faith, 
man without the nature of God, man without likeness to Christ. Are you asking about man by himself? Look at Psalm 39, verse 5. Behold, thou hast made my days as an handbreadth, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Look at this now. For, for verily, every man at his best stage is altogether vanity. Uh, what I'm telling you is, when you see a question in the Bible, you must be asking the right person. And when you have a question in your life, and when you have a challenge in your life, the question you are asking must be to the Almighty God Himself from the book of God, and then you will know He will tell you who you are. I can begin to tell you from the study of the Scriptures, what is man? When grace comes to him, when he becomes a child of God, what is man? It's a son of God. It's a daughter of God. What is man? It's a believer. What is man? A man of faith. With him all things are possible. What is man? A man indwelt by the Holy Ghost. A man indwelt by Christ. A man indwelt by the Almighty God himself. Because Jesus said, I and my Father will come unto that believer and we will make our abode in him. A man like that, a believer, a man like that, that has a solid foundation of the word of God. What is man? Let me show you, for example, from Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, we're reading now from verse 6. Hebrews chapter 2, we're looking at verse 6. It says, but one in a certain place testified, saying, what is man? The same question that we have read in Job, the same question that we have read in the Psalms, the same question we are now coming to in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 6. It says, what is man? That thou art mindful of him, or the son of man, that thou visiteth him. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, thou madest him to be a little lower than the angels. Understand, this is New Testament. Understand, this is revelation. Understand, thou madest him a little lower than angels. We could stop there, but I'm not going to stop. But you could stop there and think of what angels can do and what redeemed men, transformed men, children of God, the children of the kingdom. You can begin to think about what we can do and compare what we can do with what an angel can do. In fact, as you look at what angels can do, angels are not given the word of God to preach. Angels are not given the power to overcome Satan and the devil. Angels are not given the opportunity with the redemption we have, the power we have, the promises we have, the faith we can have, the possibilities in our lives. In fact, it says, thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor and did set him look at this and did set him over the works of thy hand and let's come to verse 9 in verse 9 it says but we see jesus who is made a little lower than angels for the suffering of death understand that for the suffering of death it's going to explain that to us at the end of the verse it said it was made a little lower than angels how so as to take our place so as to take our substitute it was made a little lower than angels to be like us so we can be like him read on it says is crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Think about that. Should taste death for every man, having taken our death away. Look at verse 10. It says in verse 10, it says, For it became him, it befitted him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory in bringing many sons unto glory. Now, if you were to place your question there, what is man? Already now, we're saved, we're born again, 
We're children of God. Our names in the book of life is giving us the power to go and see no more. It's brought us unto glory. It's brought us unto God. And you are now asking, what is man? Is to make the captain of our salvation perfect through suffering. Think about Enoch. And I want you in your mind to compare Enoch with Adam. You'll see that Enoch, once he came to know the Lord, and the Lord brought him out of the degradation, out of the defilement, out of the depravity, and he walked with God 300 years. As you compare him with Adam, you, are, or you understand what grace can do in the life of a man. Think about Joseph. You know the story of Joseph, and you know everything. He went, you know the gift and the grace in his life. And if you compare Joseph with Adam, you see, these are people that didn't just follow and go down the drain because after all, I'm a descendant of Adam. What can I be? What is man? Think about Moses, a man that had a rod in his hand and he brought water out of the rock. A man that walked and lived as if he saw the invisible. Think about Joshua, the dominion that God had given Adam Adam did not use that dominion. No time that Adam told the sun to stop or the moon to come to a standstill. He didn't choose that dominion. But think about Joshua. He was on the battlefield. And he told the sun, stay there. And he told uh, the moon, stay there. He had the dominion and he used the dominion. You are thinking about Elijah. Elijah came to Ahab. And look at that man, the dominion, the power that that man had. And he said, according to my word, there will be no rain. All these days, uh, actually about three and a half years, there was no rain. And then Elisha, that had a double portion of the Spirit of God. I'm just telling you something. That when you read your Bible, and it says, what is man? You don't line up before the defeated man. You don't line up behind the people who can be nothing and you say well what is man what can i be what can i do elisha did not think like that elisha said as the servant said what are we going to do because all these chariots they have come from assyria and he said they are more that be with us than they that be with them you see the understanding of those people those selected people about daniel daniel was in the lion's den he didn't say what can i do that man had dominion over the lions all through the night. And when the king came and he said, uh, uh, Daniel, are you still there? He said, praise the Lord King, live forever. I'm still here. The lions have not been able to hurt me. That's a man that had authority. That's a man that had power. That's a man that had dominion. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the Nebuchadnezzar said, if you will not bow down to my idol, and then I send you to that burning furry furnace. Who is that God that will deliver you out of my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't say what is man before the fire. They had dominion over the fire. The point I'm making to you is this. When you read the question, what is man? You're not going to say, well, man is nothing. Man can do nothing. Man is weak. Man cannot have dominion. Man cannot have, uh, you know, a success or victory. But when you understand the grace we have, the possibilities we have, and when you think of the promises of God that we have, those are even the Old Testament people I'm talking about. When I answer the question, what is man? A man with grace, a man with righteousness, a man with possibilities, a man with the power of God in his life, when I ask the question, when I come to the New Testament, what is man? Do you remember Peter that walked on the water? He could have said, is that you, Jesus? Yes, it's me. He could have said, well, that's Jesus. But the dominion and the power that the Lord had given to people, he, he realized, he said, if that's you, I want to be like you. And he came and he walked on the water. You think about John, that he straight tells us, they put in a bowl, in a drum of boiling oil. 
that's more terrible than boiling water and it had no effect on him. You see, he was Stephen, that when the people looked at him, they saw his face as if it was an angel talking. You see, he was Philip, just a deacon in the house of God, just a deacon among the people of God, and that Philip went down to Samaria. And then he had authority over the evil spirits, and he had authority over those sicknesses, and there was great joy in the whole city. Think about Paul, and think about Abel Silas in the dungeon, and in the prison, and in the night, in the midnight, they sang a song unto the Lord, praising the Lord, and praying unto the Lord, and the foundations of the prison, they were all shaking, and then all the people, they were delivered from all the things that will hurt them. That is man, and that is man with the grace of God. So, we are talking today on man's lost dominion regained through Christ. That is the original dominion. The dominion God had given to Adam that he did make you saw before he fell and he lost that dominion. Today we are talking about rediscovering that dominion, recovering that dominion, regaining that dominion. Man's lost dominion regained through Christ. I pray dominion will come into your life. Power will come into your life. More authority will come into your life. And when you stand in the name of Jesus, and you mention the name of Jesus, no power will be able to stand before you in Jesus' name. Look at this. We're talking about three points today as we consider this uh, dominion lost by man, but regained through the Lord Jesus Christ. Point one is the position and description of the first man. That first man, that's uh, Adam, the position he held and the uh, power that God gave to him, the description of that first man. Point number two, the pollution and defilement of the fallen man. I'm sure you've heard in your understanding, in your study of the scriptures, the fall of man. That, that, that's when Adam and Eve yielded to the suggestion of the devil, deception of the devil, and the subtlety of the devil. And they fell from the position the Lord had given them the pollution and defilement of the fallen man. Point number three is the promise of dominion for the faithful man. The man indwelt by faith. The man fortified by faith. The man energized by faith. And the man fueled by faith that is full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost. The promise of dominion for the faithful man. Let's come to point number one. In point number one, the position and the description of the first man. Look at this, the creation and the dominion of that first man. We're coming to Genesis chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, reading from verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image. Underline that, in our image after our likeness. Understand that when man was made, when man was created, when the first man came out of the hand of our creator God, he was made after the likeness of God. And let them have dominion. That's the word. Let them have dominion. Anyone coming out of the hand of the almighty God created by the almighty God, they will have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over, look at this, every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. I'm sure you have underlined in our image, you have underlined after our likeness, and you have underlined, let them have dominion. Look at verse 27. In verse 27, so God created man in his own image, so God created man in his own image, or the image of God, the image of holiness, the likeness of righteousness, the likeness of power, the likeness of great possibilities, the greatness that God had. God created man in his own image, and in the image of God 
created he him in the image of God, not in the image of an angel, not in the image of falling Lucifer, not in the image of a downtrodden personality. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Look at verse 28. In verse 28 it says that God blessed them and God bless them like when God recreates a man and when God saves a man, when God redeems a man, when God brings a man, a woman, anyone from the wilderness of sin and he brings that godly man, that righteous man unto himself, he blesses him. And if you're a child of God, if you're born again by the Lord himself, you are blessed. And don't, um, you know, degrade, degrade yourself and don't come under and allow every sin, every day can hurry to have dominion over you. And God bless them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. That word subdue, overcome it. That word subdue, have dominion over the whole earth and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. I want you now to understand the language of scripture. In the image of God created in them, after his likeness, he created them. Look at the meaning of that. In uh, Ephesians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 24. Verse 24. Please open your Bible. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That is when God created man. And he said, let us create man. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. That creation after his image, after his likeness, means he was created in righteousness and true holiness. He had dominion over sin. He had power over sin. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 10. And I put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Renewal, righteousness, holiness, godliness, because he was created after the image of him that created him and also renewed in knowledge. Adam at knowledge, Adam at wisdom, Adam at the nature of God, Adam at the righteousness of God. Now, let's look at this character then. We're coming to Genesis chapter 5, and I'm looking at verse 1, the character and the description of the foundational man. The first man is the foundational man. That first man, Adam, as he came out of the hand of the Almighty God, that's a man at the foundation, at the foundation of humanity, at the foundation of all the people that will come to there. That's why I refer to him as the first man. That's why we're referring to him as the foundational man. In Genesis chapter 5, looking at verse 1, it says, This book, this is the book, of the generations of Adam, the first man, of Adam, the foundational man, in the day that God created him, look at this, in the likeness of God, made he him, in the likeness of his righteousness, in the likeness of his authority, in the likeness of his exaltation, in the likeness of his holiness, in the likeness of his purity, in the likeness of God, made ye him. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, male and female created he them. The Lord did not make any difference and created the woman lower, not to have enough righteousness, as much righteousness, as much holiness, as much purity, as much dominion, as much power, but the same possibilities, the same power, and the same authority that you have in the man, you have in the woman, male and female, created in them, and is a blessed them. And he called their name, tell me in your Bible, 
and he called their name, I want to hear you, and he called the name Adam. That's Mr. and Mrs. Adam. Having the same surname, he created Adam. He created Eve. And both of them joined together. He named them and he called them Adam in the day when they were created. And now look at verse 22. As in that same chapter, we now see a specimen of a man that had that same dominion, that had same righteousness, that had that same holiness with which God created Adam and Eve. And Enoch walked with God as I begat Methuselah 300 years. And he begat sons and daughters. And then in verse 24, in verse 24 we are told, and Enoch walked with God. The New Testament tells us was a man of faith. A man of faith is a man of power. A man of faith is a man of dominion. A man of faith is a man of holiness. A man of faith is a man of righteousness. A man of faith is a man of purity. And it says, and Enoch what with God, and it was not, for God took him. For God took him. That's the dominion, the character, the description of the man when he first came out of the hand of God. Look at Psalm 8, reading from verse 3. In Psalm 8, reading from verse 3, when I consider thy, thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, what is man? When I consider the heavens, and I consider the work of your hand, all that you have made, what is man, that thou art mindful of him? I can answer that. In the crown of creation, in the highest, in the creatures of God, is the man that God delights in. Is the man that God has put his image and his likeness upon. That's why God is mindful of him. Have you noticed when Satan and Lucifer fell, God did not raise up a redeemer. Have you noticed when some angels fell and went with, uh, and went with Lucifer, he didn't raise up a redeemer. When man fell, God raised up a redeemer. When man became dissociated and separated from God and went into defilement and went into sin and degradation, God raised up a redeemer. God is mindful of man. God is mindful of his creatures. God is mindful of you. God is mindful of me. What is man? That thou art mindful of him. And the son of man, that thou visitest him. Look at verse 5. It says in verse 5, For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, a little lower than the angels. Before I go on, I want you, I, I, I want, whenever you read the Old Testament, you must also understand the New Testament perception of what you are reading. Now, we're born again. Now, we're redeemed. You know what we're told in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5? Don't open, I'll just tell you that now we're raised up and we're seated together with Christ in the heavenly places. In fact, it says Jesus has become a proper substitute. We're crucified with him. We died with him. We're buried with him. We're raised up together with him. Do you know what the New Testament says? It says in Colossians, I'll just tell you, you can write it down, Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. It says we're translated out of the kingdom of darkness and we're translated into his kingdom. Now you understand, when we come to this and we say, Thou hast made him, thou hast made him in the past, a little lower than angels, but now we're seated with Christ. Now he has lifted us up. Now he has raised us up. And now he has said, If you can only believe, look at this, all things are possible to him that believe it. What do you need to do then? Lift up your faith. Raise up your faith. 
increase your faith, actuate your faith. And when that faith comes alive, all the dominion that God has for you, you are going to have in Jesus' name. Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and has crowned him with glory and honor. Look at verse 6. It says in verse 6, Thou hast made him, thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Over the works of thy hand. Uh, can you place on the line, over the works of thy hands. Over the works of thy hand. You made him to have dominion over the works of thy hand. Thou hast put all things under his feet. What did I tell you to underline? Over the works of thy hands. Come back to verse 3. As you look at verse 3, it says, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the work of thy fingers, everything God made, God put man over, above, to overcome, to have dominion, to subdue everything, and to have everything under control. I pray God will lift you higher today. And I pray God himself will manifest this understanding of a man of faith, of a woman of faith in your life, even more than ever before in Jesus' name. Look at number three. In this thing I'm considering now, the commendation and dominance of the faith fortified man. The man fortified by faith. The man energized by faith. The man indwelt by faith. Look at that man. The man, the commendation of such a man. The dominance of such a man. A man fortified by faith. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 5. Before I read verse 5, do you notice something here? We have Enoch. We have Abel. We have Noah. We have Abraham. We have Sarah, we have Isaac, we have Jacob, we have Joseph, we have Moses, we have the parents of Moses, and then we have all those other people. What shall I more say? The time will fail me to mention Gideon and to mention Samson and to mention all the prophets, the people who through faith subdued kingdoms. But somebody here is missing. There's no Adam here. You see Adam? He didn't make use of faith. You see, Adam, the dominion the Lord had given him, he wasn't fortified by faith. He wasn't energized by faith. And so, when we write about the heroes of faith in the hall of faith, it was missing. Because when you have faith in God, that's when the dominion is going to be activated. When you are facing God, that's when the power is going to be activated. The commendation and the dominance of faith fortified men. We're looking at Enoch now by faith. Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him, whether it was Adam or Eve or Korah or Dathan or Byram or Cain. Anyone without faith, anyone that doesn't have faith, faith in God the Creator. Faith in Christ, our recreator, the one who has come to recreate us. And faith in the word of God, the word of the Almighty God. Anyone that does not have faith, God does not reckon with such an individual. Because without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith is what's important, and faith is what God is looking at. And as you are fortified by faith, as you are energized by faith, 
that original dominion you will have, you will manifest in every area of your life. Sin will not have dominion over you. Sickness will not have dominion over you. Satan will not have dominion over you. Satanic power, occultic power, powers of darkness in the world will not have dominion over you. All you need is to be fortified, energized, indwelt by faith. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should utter receive for an inheritance, he obeyed and he went out, not knowing whither he went. Look at verse 27. In verse 27, it says, by faith, he forsook Egypt. I can almost picture uh, Moses before Pharaoh. Not a cringy man, not a conquered man, not a coward man. He was not a coward, and he wasn't a downtrodden man. He stood in his full stature because he was a man of dominion, a man of courage, a man of power. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. A man of dominion does not fear a king does not fear Satan, does not fear demons, does not fear any personality. Because by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He endured as seeing him who is invisible. And what, that's what the Lord is telling us. He wants us to have that same dominion, that same authority, and that same power. Look at uh, First John chapter 4. In First John chapter 4, verse 17. First John chapter 4, reading from verse 17. Here the Lord is telling us about now who we are. We have believed the gospel. We have believed in what he did for us at Calvary. We have believed those words, age is finished and because of our faith in him and because of the power the authority the possibilities we now have look at this herein is our love make perfect herein is your love make perfect herein is my love make perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment look at that if we're going to have boldness in the day of judgment here, in the day of grace, we have boldness. In the day of our probation, we have boldness. In the day of our pilgrimage, we have boldness. And then we go with that boldness of the child of God until the day of judgment. It says that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because, look at this, because as he is so are we in this world when you have faith in Christ, infilled by grace, saturated by the grace of God, and you are moving on, you are propelled by faith in Christ. As he is, so are we in this world. But let's come back to Genesis and see what happened in the case of Adam. He had dominion did not know how to cherish that dominion, know how to value that dominion, how to keep that dominion, how to exercise that dominion. And he allowed a little thing to make him fall from grace, fall from power, fall from dominion. That brings us to point number two. In point number two is the pollution and defilement of the fallen man. The pollution and the defilement of the fallen man. It's now we're asking the question, what is man? Like Job asked the question, what is man? Like all those other people, we ask the question and try to answer the question. This is placing the question immediately after the fall of man and not considering the people that had power, that had dominion. Look at Job chapter 7, verse 17. In Job chapter 7, reading from verse 17, 
It says, what is man? The same question. But now the answer is going to come. But it's going to come in the light of the fall of man. Understand that. This answer that I'm going to have now will come in the light of the fall of man. What is man? That thou shouldest magnify him and that thou shouldest search thine heart upon him. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, and thou, that thou shouldest visit him every day, that thou should, shouldest visit him every day and try him every moment. Look at Job chapter 15, verse 14. Job chapter 15, verse 14. It says, what is man? That he should be clean. You see that? It's talking about man after the fall. Man, the descendants of Adam, in depravity, in defilement. So you cannot take this and spread it all over the pages of the whole of the New Testament and then forget Calvary and forget Christ and forget the fact that Christ had had dominion on our behalf. And because he overcame, we will also overcome. What is man? That he should be clean. And, and he that is born of a woman, that he should be righteous. Look at verse 15. Verse 15. It says in verse 15, Behold, he putteth no trust in his saints. Yea, the heavens are not clean in his sight. Verse 16 now. In verse 16, how much more abominable and filthy is man. He's trying to answer the question, what is man? And his answer is, man is abominable, understand, without grace, understand, without faith, understand, without redemption. How much more abominable and filthy is man, which drinketh iniquity like water. I want you to come to Psalm 144, reading from verse 3. Psalm 144, reading from verse 3. Lord, what is man? Look, sir. Uh, many of the people in the Bible were interested in the question, what is man? And here the psalmist is asking, Lord, what is man? That thou takest knowledge of him, or the son of man, that thou makest account of him. Look at verse 4. In verse 4 it says, man is like to vanity. That's his answer. Man without grace is like unto vanity. Man without faith, that's like unto vanity. Man without Christ, without conversion by Christ, and without connection with Christ. Man without sitting with Christ up above in the heavenly places, that man is like unto vanity. Man without the result and the redemption of Calvary. That man is like to vanity. His days are as a shadow that passes away. All that is talking because, number one, of the fall of man. Number one, the fall of man. Number two, as a result of that fall of man, you have the filthiness of all men. The filthiness of all men before we come to the grace of God. And then you have the failure, the fickleness, the feebleness of all men. The failure of all men. Number one is the fall of man. That's in Genesis chapter 3. Reading from verse 6. Genesis chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, the devil, in form of the serpent, I'll be talking to the woman, trying to convince the woman, no, you will not die. You can do whatever you want. You can eat of the fruit of that forbidden tree, and you will still be all right. In fact, Satan said, your eyes will be open, and you will be as God, doing good and evil. And the woman reasoned with Satan, don't ever reason with the devil. Don't ever commune with the devil. And don't ever discuss with the enemy of your soul. He's lost his own dominion. And he wanted man to also lose his own dominion. And so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, 
and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her. Underline those words, with her. With her. Adam was not far away. Adam knew what was happening. The devil did not take on Adam to start with. And Adam just stayed there. You know, there are husbands. They know what temptation is coming to their wives. They just stay there and look and gaze and glance at the whole scene. And they know what is going on between their wife and Lucifer and Satan and the devil and the deceiver and the seducers. And they just wait and they just look. Adam had dominion. Adam should have exercised dominion. But no, he will not. And she also gave unto her husband with her. And he did it. What the result is, they lost the glory of God. They lost the power of God. They lost the image of God, the likeness of God, the righteousness of God, the nature of purity and godliness. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, And the Lord God called unto Adam, and said unto him, Where art thou? How do you understand that question? Where art thou? God couldn't find him in the position of authority. Where art thou? In the position of power. Where art thou? In the position of dominion. Where art thou? He couldn't find him on the height of the crown of the first created man. Where art thou? In verse 10, it says... And he said, I heard my voice in the garden, and I was afraid. Something had come in. There was no fear at the beginning. Fear of animals, fear of lion, fear of snakes, fear of wild beasts, fear of personalities, fear of any creatures coming from the sky, coming from the depth of the sea, coming from anywhere. There was no fear. And there was no slavish fear of God. When man was created in his likeness, like a baby does not fear the mother, like a baby does not fear the father, and the baby is just happy at the presence of the father and the mother, no fear. But now man has fallen. And he now says, I was afraid. When? Because I was naked. And I hid myself, hiding himself, Weak man, fallen man, filthy man, he was now hiding himself. It says in verse 11, in verse 11, and he said, Who told thee that thou was naked as thou eating of the tree? Whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat, for well, you know the story. Man fell. You know, but Adam did not do well. He didn't confess. He didn't ask for forgiveness. He only gave excuses. Excuses. Look at Job. Chapter 31. And verse 33. If I covered my transgressions as Adam. What did Adam do? He covered his guilt. He covered his sinfulness. He covered his condemnation. He covered his action. He didn't confess. I, if I covered my transgressions as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom. That's what he did. He hid his iniquity in his bosom. And then we're told in uh, First Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 13. First Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 13. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, verse 14. In verse 14, and Adam was not deceived. I, told, I read it to you, he was with her. He was with Eve. He knew what was going on. 
and he went with his eyes opened into the scene, into the defilement, into the degradation. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Hold on. Adam, not deceived. Adam, because of his love for the wife, he wasn't deceived. He knew what was going on. The woman was deceived, and the woman was in the transgression. And the woman that has now transgressed, the woman that has fallen, now had power, dominion, influence on Adam that was not deceived. And that is why you need to, if you are a man and you are a husband, you are a man, you are a father, you are a man, you are a leader, you must hold on to that leadership. If other people are deceived, other people are fallen, and they come to you, understand your position. Understand your leadership. Understand who you are and where you stand and stand. And don't be like Adam that gave excuse and said, what can I do? My wife is giving me that to eat. What can I do? You could do something. You are created in the image of God. You could take your stand. You can report that situation back to God and God will have dealt with it. And so man fell. Now, that brings filthiness upon all men. Filthiness upon all men. In Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 12. Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 12. It tells us, Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. As by Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, look at that, defilement, entered into the world by sin and then degradation defeat entered into the world by sin and now death finally entered into the world by sin so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned we now add the nature of, uh, of Adam, and because of that nature of Adam, it became the practice of everyone for all have seen. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, it says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. That's how sin came upon everyone. We're coming to Psalm 53, reading from verses 2 and 3. Psalm 53. We're reading from verse 2 now. And God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand that did seek God. Look at verse 3. It says in verse 3, every one of them is gone back because of the fall of man. Now you have the filthiness of all men. All men before salvation. All men before believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. All men before having the grace that brought salvation. All men that continues in the depravity and the nature of Adam. Every one of them is gone back. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Look at Psalm 51, reading from verse 5. Psalm 51, from verse 5, Behold, I will shape in iniquity, depravity, original sin, that came upon man. Behold, I was shape in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Look at Psalm 58, verse 3. Psalm 58, verse 3, is talking about the depravity of man. It's talking about the nature, the sinful nature of man. You come into this world and you're not born again. You're not born again because you are born by a Christian father, a Christian mother. The nature of Adam, everything still goes back to Adam, the first man. And it says in Psalm 58, verse 3, the wicked are estranged from the womb. 
that nature is implanted in the child even from the birth from birth it says the wicked it says the sinner it says the ungodly it says the transgressor is uh, they are estranged from the womb they go astray as soon as they be born speaking lies have you noticed nobody teaches a child to lie just picks it up just does it it's not seen the example in any other person to tell a lie and that child just picks it up that's the nature that's depravity it tells us in isaiah chapter 48 reading from verse 8 isaiah chapter 48 reading from verse 8 it says yea thou hadest not yea thou knewest not yea from that time that thine ear was not opened for i knew that thou wouldest deal very treacherously i was called look at this i was called a transgressor from the womb a transgressor from the womb we have we need power from calvary power from the cross of christ power from the sacrifice of christ to deliver us from the practice of sin the habit of sin and the nature of sin because we were transgressors from the womb it tells us in isaiah chapter 64 reading from verse 6 isaiah 64 reading from verse 6 but we are all on the line that all everyone without christ all everyone natural all everyone born of a woman all everyone before salvation all but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses all our righteousnesses the righteousness of the so-called righteousness of the moral man of the religious man of the philosophical man of the psychological man of the hypocritical man of every kind of man all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags and we all do fade away as a leaf and our iniquities are like the wind have taken us away it says in verse 7 in verse 7 it says and there is none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee for thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities and then he tells us in romans chapter 3 verse 10 romans chapter 3 we're looking at verse 10 it says as it is written there is none righteous no not one in verse 11 it says there is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. In verse 12, it says, they are all gone out of the way. When I learn the word all, that is, before we come to Christ and before we know him as a savior, as a substitute, as a redeemer, as our propitiation for sin, as the one that has come to bring complete redemption for us before we know him we're all gone out of the way they are all together become unprofitable there is none that do it good no not one verse 13 in verse 13 their throat is an open sepulcher with their tongues they have used the seed the poison of herbs is under their leaves and in verse 14 it says whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness verse 15 says their feet are swift to shed blood in verse 16 it said destruction and misery are in their ways then in verse 17 and the way of peace they have not known verse 18 says there is no fear of God before their eyes. And now verse 19 brings us to the conclusion. Upon all the world, upon all the descendants of Adam, now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped 
and all the world may become guilty before God. All the world now guilty before God. In fact, it says in verse 20, in verse 20, therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified, justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Verse 23, in verse 23, it now confirms, for all have sinned, Adam, Eve, Cain, Abel, all their descendants, unto the present day, without Christ, without God, without faith, without confession, without salvation, without redemption, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And man will continue to fail. Man will continue to fall. Man will continue to sin as long as he does not have the grace of God and faith in God and faith in Christ and faith in the finished work of Calvary. That's man. That's why you have the failure of man. In fact, as you go far back to Genesis chapter 6, reading from verse 5. Genesis chapter 6, reading from verse 5, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. The wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was number one, evil. Number two, only evil. I could not have good and evil, bad and good, only evil and that continually. Why? Because that's what man is. Because without help from above and without redemption, without forgiveness, let alone for yourself by yourself, Less left alone by himself. Every man is so powerless and so feeble, he cannot overcome sin by himself. That's why it says, without me, ye can do nothing. Nothing profitable, nothing good, nothing clean, nothing righteous, nothing holy, without his grace. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 13, reading from verse 23. It says, can, an Ethiopian, can the Ethiopian change his skin? Or the leopard is sports? Then will ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. It's talking about the depravity of man the degradation of man, the defilement of man, and the impossibility of man to live righteously by himself. It tells us in Romans chapter 7, reading from verse 15, For that which I do, I allow not, even when I know better in the head, even when I know better with knowledge, Yet, if I do not have grace for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. Have you found that if you don't have Christ, if you don't have the grace of Christ, if you don't have faith in Christ, if you don't have the dominion that Christ has purchased for us on the cross of Calvary, what you hate is what you'll do. Why do you hate it? Because you see the consequence. Because you see your loss, what you lose by what you do. And yet, even though you see what you lose, even though you see all that you don't want in your life, yet you are powerless until you come to Christ. It says, what I hate, that I do. Verse 16. In verse 16, if then I do that, I would not. That which does not even please me, I consent unto the law that it is good. In verse 17, now then, 
it is no more I that do it. Look at this. But sin that dwells in me. Sin that sits on the throne of my heart. Sin that controls me from the heart. Sin that has dominion over me in the heart. It says, sin that dwells in me. In verse 18, it says, I know that in me, that he is in my flesh, on the throne of my heart, on the seat of control in my life, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. And then in verse 20, in verse 20 it says, Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it. Here is depravity at work. Here is the original sin at work. Here is that original weakness at work. But sin that dwells in me. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 1. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And you, as he quickened, who are dead in trespasses and sins, where we are dead, that's our depravity, who are dead, that's the natural man, who are dead, that's the origin of sinfulness in the man who has not known Christ, and you, as he quickened, who oh, are dead in trespasses and sins. But still says, wherein in time past, before Christ, before salvation, before faith in Christ, before conversion, before redemption, wherein in time past, ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. That was the control of our lives before we knew the Lord. Look at this. The spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience. Look at verse 3. Something important in verse 3 for you to look at. Among whom also we all urge a conversation in times past. Understand? In times past. Please note, in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Look at this. And we're by nature. And we're by nature. That's how we're born. And we're by nature, by original sin. And we're by nature, original depravity. And we're by nature, the children of wrath, underlying this, even as others. Even as others. What can bring the change? What has brought the change? Look at verse 4. In verse 4 it says, But God, He is going to recreate us again. But God he is going to redeem. But God, He loves us. What is man that thou visitest him? And the Son of man that you have any compassion on him? But God, when Lucifer fell, God did not redeem. But God, in the case of humanity, when all those angels fell, God did not run after them and redeem. But now, but God, when man fell, he raised up the plan of salvation. He raised up the way wherewith we can be forgiven. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. He loved us. And then in verse 5, it says, Even when we were dead in sins, as quickened us together with Christ, by grace are ye saved. By grace ye are saved. By grace ye are saved. Now that grace comes in, it brings us to point number 3 now. The promise we have, the possibilities we have, the power we have, the dominion we now have, the authority we now have, the promise of dominion for the faithful man, for the faith-filled man, for the man that is full of faith, for the faithful man, faith-filled man, when your heart has faith in God, 
when you place your faith in God. And when you stand in that faith in what Calvary has done for us, now the promise we have, now the authority we have, now the dominion we have. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, reading from verse 6. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Go visit Calvary. I know you have. Visit Calvary again. And as you are coming from Calvary and coming from under uh, the blood of the Lamb that cleanses you, that washes you, that redeems you, have this mind, have this thought, I've been to Calvary, and now I am no more like the man of the old covenant, and the man in the new covenant, and I'm made a little lower than the angels, and thou crownest him with glory and with honor. Underline that, he now crowns you with glory and with honor, and did set him over the works of thy hand. In verse 8, it says, Thou hast put all things in subjection on thy feet. Thou hast put all things in subjection on thy feet. For in that he has put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. Stop there for a moment. You know, when you read the Bible, and you read one single sentence, you have to understand. And don't open this, I'll just tell you. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. I know you know that. A child is born, Bethlehem. A son is given, that's a Calvary. In that same sentence, it says, And the government shall be upon a shoulder, and that is still to come. The government shall be upon a shoulder. And you read that in a single sentence. Now come back to this verse in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8. It says, Thou hast put all things in subjection, under his feet. For in that he has put all things in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. And now the next sentence, this is now talking, understand, we've read about Calvary, we've read about redemption, we've read about his provision for those who are saved, for those who are born again, but now he goes to the time of the second coming and he goes to the time of the millennium when everything will be literally under him and he will reign over everything literally and now he says but now we we'll see not yet all things put under him we we'll see not yet all things put under him he says is king and he's going to reign is reigning now in the lives, in the hearts of the believers, yet he has not set up the millennial. That's what he's saying. We we'll see not yet all things now put under him. Talk that away in your mind. The time will come when all things will be under him and under his dominion. Now we come to verse 9. We're coming now back to people who are redeemed, who are ransomed, who are cleansed, and people who are brought into dominion of the present day through their accomplished work at Calvary. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. You know, he's uh, talked about who have not seen everything put under him. We have not seen the millennial reign. The millennial reign is coming and it will come later but now it's saying we see Jesus Christ who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death is coming back to Calvary crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God
blood should taste death for every man. Calvary. Taste death for every man. That is the redemption that has been finished. He has tasted death for every man and he will not die again. As a result of that death on the cross of Calvary. Look at verse 10. In verse 10 it says, But it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory. You see that? The result of Calvary. You see that? The result of redemption. Bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Look at verse 11. Now this result. It says in verse 11, for both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one united, all of one seated together, all of one uh, having the same privilege, all of one, the same dominion, all of one, the same power, all of one, the same privilege, all of one. It says, he who sanctifies Jesus as Savior and Jesus as sanctifier and they who are saved and they who are sanctified and they who are purified and they who are made holy and they who are made righteous and they who have that original sin that depravity taken away and they who are sanctified we are of one we are like him he came to take our place so that we can get to his place and it says we're now sanctified and we're all of one for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren not ashamed to call them brethren this brings us to dominion this brings you to dominion look at three things here number one our redemption and dominion over sin. Our redemption and dominion over sin. Number two, our recovery of dominion through sanctification. Our recovery of dominion through sanctification. Number three, our realization of dominion during service. That is, while we're serving the Lord. That's when the dominion comes. When we're serving the Lord, that's when you can exercise the dominion. Look at number one, our redemption and dominion over sin. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7, it says, In whom we have redemption, not that we're going to have, not that we might have, not that by and by, after doing this and doing that, maybe we'll have. It says we have that redemption already. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, as well as freedom from sin. Understand? They go together. Freedom, forgiveness. Forgiveness, freedom. Salvation, and then authority over that sin. We have the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. Who has delivered us? Understand the language? Not that we might be delivered. Not that maybe he will deliver us. Not that when the time comes, in due time, will be delivered. It's done it already. Stand up and claim it. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son? Actually, with salvation, with redemption, and with forgiveness, and with freedom, he has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Look at verse 14, that redemption in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin as well as the freedom from sin. It tells us in Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 11. Romans chapter 6, verse 11, likewise reckon ye also yourself. Now it's done. Reckon it done. Believe it done. 
accept ye that is done. Like Abraham reckoned that promise of God as done and he staggered not at the promise of God. Also in your life, reckon it done because it's done. Reckon it done, you will see it. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 12, in verse 12 it says, Let not sin therefore reign in your, mother, in your mortal body. Don't allow it. Now you have the power. Now you have the authority. And it says, don't allow sin to have dominion over you. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey each in the loss thereof. Look at verse 13. It says in verse 13, neither yield your, your members as instruments of a righteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And here comes verse 14. This is a verse you must have as a practical fulfillment in your life, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Because of redemption, you have dominion over sin. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. You are not under the law, but under grace. Under grace, what does that mean? Titus will tell us. Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 11. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation as appeared to all men. Verse 12, teaching, that for teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly. We can, because the grace of God is now there. We can, because we now have dominion. It says we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Verse 13, when we're in that position, of dominion over sin. That is the only time we can be looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 14, here is what Christ has done, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself. Here we are, a peculiar people, zealous of good works. A peculiar people, zealous of good works. Now you can recover your dominion. Look at uh, dominion that we have, uh, our recovery of dominion through sanctification. Through sanctification. Hebrews chapter 2. I'm reading now from verse 11. Hebrews chapter 2. We're reading from verse 11. For both he that sanctifies, you look, look at that word sanctified. Some people got sanctified before, and those who are still going to be sanctified, he can do it today. And he's still in the business of sanctifying, sanctifying, sanctifying. Everyone who comes and consecrates, you understand? Many people were saved many years ago, and salvation did not stop just with them. After that, other people get saved. After that, other people are getting saved. And today, others who are going to call on the name of the Lord are going to be saved. And tomorrow, other people who are going to be saved are going to be saved. And sanctification has not stopped because I got sanctified those years. And you got sanctified that year. And she got sanctified that other time. Those who are going to be sanctified today. Christ is still in the business of sanctifying everyone who comes, who prays, who consecrates, who believes for that sanctification. But he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause is not ashamed to call them brethren. Because now he, come, he brings us into the family of God. Because now he brings us into the congregation of the saints who are sanctified and set apart 
by the sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. That's the offering, that's the sacrifice, that's the blood that purifies us, that cleanses us, that sanctifies us, that takes away that Adamic nature. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. For by one offering, it's not offering it over and over. It's not going to Calvary over and over. It's not shedding the blood over and over. The one he has done, the redemption he has uh, proclaimed and he has purchased for us is still at work today. For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Look at uh, verse uh, 15 there. In verse 15 it says, Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, verse 16, This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts. And in their minds I will write them. And in verse 17, it says, And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. He forgives all our sins. He forgets all our past sins. He frees us from all our past sins. And he raises us up. And he places us on the throne to be with Christ. And he grants us dominion through that sanctification. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22, it tells us to abstain from all appearance of evil. Now that we are born again, now that we are children of God, that now that we have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, abstain from all appearance of evil. And then it says in verse 23, and it says, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming, until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you do it? Look at verse 24. It says, Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. We have the recovery of dominion through sanctification. Now, the realization of dominion during service. Realization of dominion during service. Maybe you want to underline as you are writing during service. You know, the dominion will not be exercised if we don't have the service we are rendering to the Lord. Some people say, I don't understand. Uh, the Bible says we have dominion. I believe I have dominion. I never see the dominion. Can I tell you something? It was while Moses was in service of the Lord and ministering to the people, providing water for those who are thirsty. That's when he had dominion. It was when he obediently went to Pharaoh and he said, let my people go. That's when he had the dominion. It is when you are in service and when you are doing what you ought to do for the service of the Lord, that's when you are going to have the dominion. It was while Joshua was on the battlefield and he, want, he needed extra time so that he could have he could have the total victory it was when he was in dominion that's when when he was in service that's when he had dominion it was when elijah saw the wickedness of the nation and he wanted to bring them back to god and he said god what are you going to do that these people will turn back to god if they are farming if, the, if there's no rain and there's no dew their minds will be turned back to the lord that's that's when you have dominion. According to my word, there will be no dew, there will be no rain. All these years, when the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have 
Abednego have dominion over the fire when they were taking their stand for God. It was during that time of serving the Lord, they had dominion. How, how is it that Daniel had victory over the lion? It was because he prayed. They said he should not pray and that nobody will pray all these, uh, all these days, a whole month unto any God. And he said, I will pray anyhow. I'll pray all the same. It was when he was serving the Lord. That's when he had the dominion. When they Paul the apostle had the dominion and he told that man, stand upright on your feet. And the man stood up and you, and you walk. When it was when he was in service unto the Lord. And when the Paul and Silas, when did they shake the prison doors? And then all those foundations of the prison, they were shaking. And everyone's bands were loose when they were serving the Lord. And through that service, they were put in the prison. And then they sang, I praise to the Lord. And they prayed. And the prison doors were open. I'm telling you, there will be the realization of dominion in your ministry in your life when you are occupied and you are busy in the service of the Lord. Look at uh, Acts of the Apostles chapter 1 verse 1, the former treatise have I made O Theophilus of all that Jesus began, look at this to do, both to do and to teach. When you continue in what Jesus began to do and to teach, the word began shows that Jesus had not finished the work. And what he would have been doing if he were here now, what he began to do, he will continue to do. And when those disciples, when those apostles, when those servants of God, when they continued both to do and to teach, that's when the authority came. That's when the power was manifested. Look at verse 8. In verse 8 it says, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. It is when you are witnessing for the Lord that dominion you will realize. Look at chapter 4 of Acts, Acts chapter 4 from verse 33. And it says, And with great power give the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Not when they were idle, not just sitting down and doing nothing, not being afraid and standing or sitting or cowering behind the closed doors when they were giving witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Great grace and great power was upon them. Look at um, chapter 6 of Acts. Acts chapter 6, we're reading from verse 8, and stealing full of faith and power. Did great wonders, did. You must be doing something. You must be preaching the word. You must be exalting Christ. You must be serving the Lord, only at that time you'll come to the realization of the dominion in your life and still being full of faith and power, the great wonders and miracles among the people. Look at verse 10 in verse 10 and they were, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. He was speaking. That's when the wisdom came. He was speaking. That's when the ability came. It is while you're serving, you come to the exercise of the dominion. Acts chapter 8 from verse 5. In Acts chapter 8 verse 5, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and he preached Christ unto them. You must be doing something, preaching the word, teaching the word, and you must be emphasizing the word of God, earnestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints. It's when you are in the midst of duty at the center of serving the Lord that dominion in your life will be realized. It says in verse, it says in verse 6, in verse 6 it says, and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing, hearing and seeing. They were hearing and then they could see. Let them hear something from you. Let the world, let the sinners, let your neighbors hear something from you. Then they will see, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. In verse 7 it says, for unclean spirits, 
crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with pulses were that were lame, they were delivered. Then in verse 8, and it says, And there was great joy because Philip rose up, because Philip went down to Samaria, because Philip preached, because Philip declared the word, because Philip was busy in the service of the Lord. There was great joy in that city. Get up and do something. Rise up and do something. And while you're in the service of the Lord, power, dominion, authority was multiplied, manifested in your life, through your life, and through your ministry, and through your service, in Jesus' name. Look at Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 17. And the 70 returned again with joy. If they didn't leave for service, they will not return again with joy. If they, didn't go, if they didn't go out, the 70. I'm not an apostle. I'm not one of the 12. I don't think I can do this. I hear Christ saying I can. I hear Calvary saying I can. I hear the word of God saying I can. I hear the new covenant saying I can. But I'm not sure. If you don't try so and go, you will not return with joy. It is while you are in service, during serving the Lord, that's when the dominion will be realized in your life. And the, and the 70 returned again with joy saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. We add dominion. We add power. We add authority. And even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. In verse 18, verse 18 says, And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now verse 19, it says, Behold, I give unto you power. Behold, I give unto you power. Here was before Calvary. Don't be surprised. Before Calvary, just like before Calvary, he told that paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. The benefits of Calvary given to that man, even before Calvary. Don't forget, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Before Calvary, the benefit of Calvary was given to that woman. Even the benefit of Calvary given to these 70. And if it was given to them before Calvary, how much more now after Calvary is given unto you? As said, is given unto you the authority and the power and the dominion is given unto us in Jesus' name. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. I'm sure you know this over all the power of the enemy. All the power of the enemy. All the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Say amen. I said, you say amen. He has given us the power. You know, sometimes you're looking for your car key. You didn't know you had it in the pocket. And you said, you thought it was on the table. You didn't find it on the table. And the thing is delaying, you're going out. And then you go back to the bedroom. And you look that everywhere you put up the pillow, put up everywhere. Where's my key? You call your wife. Did you take the key? No, I didn't. You call the boy. Did you take my car, my car key? No, I didn't. Ha, where is my key? And you searched everywhere. And time is going and time is going. And you search. And something just happened. And uh, your wife said, what's that bulging in your pocket? Oh, look at me. The thing was in my pocket. The power has been given unto you. And there are people who are running to the mountain. They are running to the valley. They are fasting. They are turning this way and turning that way. And I'm saying, what are you looking I'm looking for power. Power. I'm looking for power. It's in your hand already. I give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth is loose in heaven. Adam did not have more than that. Adam, in the first creation, 
as God gave him dominion, he didn't have more than that, that whatever he loosed on earth is loosed in heaven, whatever he bound on earth is bound in heaven. Adam did not have any dominion more than that, stopping the sun, stopping the moon. Adam did not have anything more than that, going through fire, it will not burn you, and going through the river, it will not drown you. Adam did not have any authority more than that, and healing all sicknesses, Adam did not have anything more than that. In fact, you know, when Cain killed Abel, Adam did not even say, do any, have any attempt to raise him up, to raise the dead. But look at what Jesus has said after Elijah raised the dead, after Elisha raised the dead, after the dead bone of Elisha raised the dead. He says, go and preach the gospel, cleanse the lepers, and preach the gospel to them, and raise the dead, and cast out devils. He has given us the dominion now. He has given us the authority now. The authority were lost in Adam. The dominion were lost in Adam. We have gained it back. Rise up now on your feet and say, Lord, I thank you for the revelation. I thank you for what you have given to me. I thank you for what you have given to every servant of God. Everyone that believes in you, open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, I know I got it today and as I'm serving you, I'm going to realize it in Jesus' name. Realization will come to you during service. Adam lost it, Jesus brought it back, and now you can regain it in your life. It's yours, it's yours, it's there. You can have it now as you accept all the promises of God. And after this meeting, go over and go through your Bible again. Anything that is new to you that the Lord has revealed, go over that again and then commit yourself, consecrate yourself. I will keep on serving the Lord. You're going to realize dominion in your life in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your revelation. We thank you for your power. We thank you for the divine ability. We thank you for the possibilities you gave to Adam which he lost. But now you didn't stop there. You gave us Christ. You gave us your only begotten son. You gave us the Redeemer and he has brought back again. He has restored unto us what we lost in Adam. And now we come to you. We accept your promise we accept your gift. We accept everything you have given us. The key, the power, the authority, the dominion that you have given us. Everyone, brother and sister, every servant of God will receive and accept everything now in Jesus' name. And as your people go forth serving you, Lord, I pray on the field there will be victory over sin. There will be victory over sickness. There will be victory over Satan. There will be victory through sanctification. And there will be victory as we serve you wholeheartedly in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, tonight, tonight, move everyone at least a step further. Move everyone at least a step higher. Move everyone at least a step forward in Jesus' name power in every life, authority in every life, dominion in every life. Let there be realization in every life, even from tonight in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you and keep on manifesting that authority from today in your life more than ever before in Jesus' name.